The following presentation was recorded at the 2017 ANZIC's Safety and Quality Conference. What I'm actually going to talk about is not just the second edition, but I thought I might give you a bit of information about what we know about the impact of the first edition of the standards as well, um, because that's kind of interesting and useful. Um, Okay, so in terms of the first edition of the standards, we've got a bit of feedback from various sources. Uh, a survey of rapid response, response systems, some time series data from some of the statewide programs and uh, information that's come from the accreditation processes. So this graph here is a survey, first of all it was done in 2010, so before the standards were introduced, and then it was repeated in 2015 as part of a project that the Commission was doing looking at the impact of the standards. Now obviously the changes that have occurred in those five years, not just about the standards, there's a lot of stuff going on around the place um, and so this is more of an association. Um, the samples in this survey are not the same. Uh, so in 2010 we had 218 hospitals who participated, 2015 uh, 276 and they're not necessarily the same hospitals so we didn't do any statistical analysis of that but nonetheless you can see there's an indication there of in that time more hospitals have put in place systems particularly looking here around systems around recognition of patients who are deteriorating in terms of you know, policies about observations, having some kind of early warning or track and trigger system, having some kind of response protocol, escalation protocol and handover process. Um, what's not shown here is that there was also in that time an increase in hospitals that had some form of rapid response system in place went from 66% to 85%. I guess the thing to say here with the standards in general is to pick up on Rob's point about we have been, I guess at the Commission, consistently agnostic about what kind of system you need to have in place. You just need to have something, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, and so the other one that with the graph here is about building this into your governance processes. So looking at how this actually is incorporated in terms of whether there's a governance process around rapid response systems, regular reports to the executive and collection of data about the effectiveness, which is quite an interesting thing with less than half 2010 doing it, but almost 90% doing it uh, in 2015, which is excellent. So you can see that in that five years, those uh, hospitals are tending to put systems in place around uh, rapid response systems and hopefully that's going to lead to improved outcomes. What we have that supports that, this is data from Between the Flags. Um, so Between the Flags, as most people will know, introduced New South Wales 2010 uh, uh, before the standards again, but the elements of Between the Flags align very strongly, actually you know, mirror what, what's in the standards. So, you know, not causality but association. So this graph here shows uh, the increase in rapid response calls over five years since the introduction of Between the Flags and a decrease uh, in cardiac arrest rates um, over that time. And I think uh, for anybody who's in the audience from the CEC that that has continued in the few years following that. Yes, Lisa? Yep. So that trend is continuing. And, and we have similar kinds of information from, uh, as part of this project, we also did some work with Daryl in terms of uh, analysing some of the ANZIX data and analysing some of the data from um, Victoria and also seeing a decrease in admissions to ICU for cardiac arrest and a decrease in cardiac arrest in Victoria. So kind of consistent sort of picture across this time frame. And again, not just about the standards, but a whole lot of things happening at the same time. So this complex graph, and I'll explain it to you in a sec, it's actually not as bad as it looks, um, is data that comes from uh, accreditation. So this is the data for 2016, all kinds of health services. These are the numbers of the actions um, and the green bits are the bits where health services are met. Uh, the purple ones at the very top are met with merit, the reds are not met and the ones at the bottom are not applicable. And the not applicable, because this is all kinds of health service, it doesn't actually get rid of the ones who, for whom uh, the types of health service for whom rapid response systems are not applicable. 
um, you know, some of the uh, small community-based services that are included in the standards. Um, so what this shows is that um, for most actions, that most of the actions in Standard 9 are core and pretty much everybody's meeting all of those core actions at their first assessment. Um, the ones down the far end and 9.3.1 uh, uh, is... Um, they're developmental ones, and they're the ones where there is a bit of leeway, so people are not quite getting those ones. You get a better picture with this one here, which I'm sorry, I know it's even more complicated, but it's actually not. What this is is showing the change over time. Uh, so this is the actions are either met or met with merit for the four years since the introduction of the standards. And what you can see here is that even for the core actions, there is still some improvement over time. More people are getting them, even though it was pretty high to start with. It's, you know, a little bit of change. But what's really interesting, I think, with this one is the developmental one. So the developmental ones down on the right-hand side are about communication with patient and families, patient and family escalation. Um, and over the years, you can see that at the beginning when the standards were first introduced, people were not really focusing on them very much. Understandably, this was new stuff. It wasn't your core processes that, you know, as Rob showed, people have been doing this for some time. So we introduced some new stuff in the standards but made it developmental. But over time, actually, people are getting their act together, they're starting to think about this and starting to put those systems in place. So you can see that change over time. Okay, so that's what we know about the uh, first edition of the standards. And w uh, we have been working for the last few years to develop the second edition. And the reason for that is that the first edition of the standards were written back in... Uh, 2009, 2010, and we've learnt a lot since then. We've also got a lot of feedback from health services out into the system about some things that could be changed, some improvements that could be made. And so we've gone through a whole lot of uh, development process, review processes, working with clinicians, working with consumers, working with policymakers uh, to actually make those changes and, and have gone through a lot of consultation processes. The second edition of the standards was signed off by health ministers uh, just a couple of weeks, a month ago. Um, so they have now been agreed and I'll get to the time frames about what's happening with that in a sec. So in terms of uh, recognising and responding to deterioration, which was standard nine, we actually have reduced the number of standards. We've only got eight in the second edition. Uh, so patient ID has disappeared and bits of patient ID have been incorporated into uh, communicating for safety. The falls and the pressure injury standards, which were very, very similar in terms of their structure, have bits of those have been taken and put into a new standard that's about comprehensive care. Um, so we, we've reduced the number of standards overall. So recognising and responding to deterioration is now standard eight. It's the last one of the set. And the major changes with that are really around the scope. So it was previously um, recognising and responding to deterioration in acute care, acute health facilities, I think, or something like that. Um, it's now recognising and responding to acute deterioration. Um, and that deterioration actually includes now both or all of physiological, cognitive and deterioration in mental state. So in the previous edition of the standards, deterioration in mental state was explicitly excluded. It was only about uh, physiological deterioration, but that is now included. And we, uh, and we know that that's a change and we know that that's going to be tricky and tough to think about. There is, you know, part of the reason that we have done that is that there actually has been quite a bit of work going on. Um, and we uh, have been working with people. We're doing a lot of work around mental health. We're doing a lot of work around cognitive impairment at the Commission. And so we'll be doing resources to support that. What it means is that for you guys who are often the custodians of this work uh, within your hospital, we'll need to start to think about involving more people in that process because it's not just going to be about intensive care providing uh, physical, physiological health care to people. This is actually broader. Um, the standard's been streamlined, uh, so the number of actions in the standard has been reduced. It actually doesn't mean that 
they're, they're actually, the actions are, there are fewer of them, but they're chunky. So they often have a number of bits to them. And uh, there have been things that have cut out. It has definitely been streamlined, but it, a lot of the stuff is still actually the same. It's just arranged differently. Um, the focus now is, is more explicitly on what you need to achieve and the systems and the skills that you need to get to the desired outcome rather than the specific bits. So certainly for us at the Commission, um, if we'd had more, one more conversation about observation charts, we may well have slid our wrists. So we have got rid of those specific actions about obs charts and about providing training about BLS and actually just highlighted you need to have a workforce that is skilled and able to provide the care that is needed. You need to have a system around monitoring observations in a graphical, in a graphical way. So how you do it, it's up to you, um, but this is what you need to achieve. Um, one of the big things with the standards, and this is across the whole lot, is that there's no do more developmental items. Everything is core. Everything in the standards this time is core. No more developmental. So that's going to be something to think about, and uh, that includes a patient and family escalation. So a lot of people are moving towards that, but that's going to be something that people will need to think about uh, in next time. Um, you need to think about the implementation of this in a more integrated way. And it's interesting what I was talking about around how things work on the ward, because I think one of the things for us is our new comprehensive care standard. If you haven't had a look at it, I would recommend that you do so, because it is actually really, really important. Um, it, it is actually the core around which a lot of this stuff sits. And when you think about what you're doing here in terms of the recognising and responding to deterioration, you are going to have to think about it in terms of your governance standard, in terms of your partnering with consumer standards, communicating for safety, but particularly about your, your comprehensive care standard. So they really need to fit together. And, and, the, and what we knew from last time is that people would divvy up the standards and give one to whoever. You can't do that this time. You actually have to think about it as a whole and in an integrated way. Okay, timelines. Um, uh, the standards will be released in November. Uh, the second edition will be released along with a whole lot of guides and supporting resources. Uh, in 2018, we'll be doing training for the accrediting agencies so that everybody knows what's going on. We need to have the Commission, the accrediting agencies, the health services all on the same page about what these things mean and what's going to happen. Um, it will not be until January 2019 that when your next uh, accreditation cycle comes around, you'll be assessed against the second decision. That is only 18 months away. Um, scarily, uh, but nonetheless there's time uh, from, from when the standards will be released. There is already on the website a draft version of the second edition. It's not the final one, but it's pretty similar. Um, and if you have trouble finding it, because I often have trouble finding stuff on our website, just Google it. It's the easiest way. Um, so, in summary, um, we've seen improvements over time uh, associated with the standards, reflecting that there is a lot of stuff going on in the states and territories, in individual hospitals that clinicians are doing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're going to have some reports around this that will be coming out in the next few months. Um, the second edition provides an opportunity for, for, to build on the successes that we had with the first one uh, and, and make further improvements. And, and as I say, you've got about 18 months to think about that. And we're doing a lot of work around actions, approaches that you can use to do, to do that. So have questions, please get in touch. Thank you.